All right, everyone. Thank you again for joining the Startup Society's Foundation podcast. Today, we have a real big treat. Uh, we have Alain Berto. He's an urbanist at the Marion Institute of Urban Management, and he's the author of Order Without Design. Uh, Alain, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Uh, so I think what, what makes the most sense to give context to our listeners who are not familiar with your work uh, is to just explain what the title is. Because of when people think about urban planning, they usually think about design. They usually think about planning. Yes. Why are you, why are you hesitant for a planner to be designing? Uh, because uh, because of my experience, you know, I, I started as a designer. I thought that uh, uh, the main problem of cities were bad design, even to the point where if in developing countries, uh, people were living in slums, it's just that they didn't know to design a good house, you know, a nice house, or didn't have time to do so. So I thought that design will solve everything. And uh, uh, later, even when I, uh, you know, I started working in New York in, uh, that was in 68, so that's a long time ago, uh, for the city planning commission, I was assigned a housing project in Harlem. And the idea was that there were at the time a, a, a lot of uh, social problem in Harlem, you know, a lot of uh, drug addiction in particular, extreme poverty, a, a lot of houses which had, uh, uh, even the people were so poor that they were disconnected from, from electricity and water and people were still living in them, in those houses. And uh, my colleague planner and, and myself, I must admit uh, at the time, were convinced that uh, if we design nice houses for those people and put poor people with drug addiction in a nicely designed house, problem solved. And uh, so I spent quite a bit of time in Harlem and to my dismay, I realized that this was a completely stupid project. Uh, eventually, uh, later, you know, I, uh, I work in other contexts and little by little, I understood that, by the way, design is important, uh, but design is important at a certain scale and to solve certain problems. So, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the problem, I think, and the way I learn planning, and I think many of my colleagues learn planning, is that they consider that a city is just a very large building, very large complex building. A city is not, has nothing to do with a large building. That means that, uh, you know, if you have a large building, you know, a, a real large building, for instance, a factory or a museum, you have to design everything in detail. And the more details it is in advance, the better it is. You know, you better know uh, every lamp, every door, and you know, the way, whether it opened one way or another in advance. If not, it will be terrible. In a city, if you use the same attitude, it's opposite. Why? Because a city is made of people and a city become productive and innovative and they need to be innovative by the way precisely because those people act in a way which is unpredictable so the city is made really of a lot of people and and firms you know they are i would say household and firms who each of them act in a creative way which is not predictable but they have information about their business which is better than any urban planner could ever have. So we have to, now, some of them have bad ideas, but uh, those who have bad ideas by necessity will also disappear, or their, their business will disappear. You know, if you, for instance, if you are a developer and you build a house that you think is innovative, but nobody wants to live there, uh, that will be the last house you built. So you do not have to worry too much and you, you have only wasted one house. But imagine that if you are a planner and you think that you know how people want to live and you design a house for everybody in the city, uh, this is a, a, a fantastic disaster. So you see that now, uh, I, uh, you know, in spite of the title of my book, I am not saying that the design is uh, useless for planners. Uh, when people agglomerate in a way and, and associate in a way which is not predictable, as they agglomerate, especially a high density and expand, 
you need to design an infrastructure to allow this contact, you know, this face-to-face -face contact. This is where we, we will lead to the COVID, by the way. This face-to-face -face contact, which creates this productivity where they can ex exchange goods and services. So this, uh, at a large scale, cannot be done by uh, the spontaneous, let's say, effect of uh, the market or thing like that. So it has to be designed, and it has to be designed top down. You know, if you if you design a subway system, or a highway system, or a water system, let's say the water system for New York City, uh, don't expect the you know the initiative of individuals to create a water system for for you know you have to design it top down. It's an engineering thing, but you should design it to serve this spontaneous uh, movement of people. You cannot say, hey, uh, if I design my water system this way, uh, and if people then live differently, uh, I will save uh, a billion dollars on one water system, and therefore I will force people to live there. You know, I uh, I take the example for instance, if you you wanted to design a, a sewer system like that, and you wanted to have the, the cheapest, you know, the most efficient sewer system for a city, you will have the sewer plant in the center of the city. You know, they, from the point of view of the sewer, that would be the most efficient. Uh, of course, it will not be the most efficient in the terms of the, the way the city function. And you will see it right away, by the way, because around the sewer plant, the, the price of real estate will collapse. You know, nobody wants to live next to a sewer plant. So you see this is this dichotomy, uh, this paradox in a way that a city is a spontaneous, uh, you know, emerging form and you have to let it as much as possible form by itself but you have to serve it by something which is designed top down which is infrastructure but you should concentrate on the infrastructure and avoid as much as possible to de design individual building so another aspect too which is extremely important is in advance to separate what is public from what is private you know, again, here the market doesn't do it well. You know, and for instance, if you have a, a city and there is a very nice beach on the around the city or river, for instance, uh, it's not a good. Usually, you have to separate the you know the edge of the river uh, to make it a public space. Uh, you know, whether or a marina, or whatever. But this can be done also only top down. You know, the market will not do it if you you let the market act, uh, everything which is really valuable in the city, like a beach or, or, or a, a river, uh, will be privately developed and not available for the citizens. And that's not an ideal. So, so you have here to, to delimitate, uh, you know, the, the things which are important to keep for the city in advance, and then the right of ways of the streets, you know, not maybe every street, but the major street, which will allow the the city to expand and especially to uh, to communicate, you know, with each other, you know, the, this thing. Because again, the the major idea of the book is that uh, uh, a city is a labor market, uh, you know, it, uh, and this is the primary thing. And it this labor market creates, of course, all of, make possible all the things that we like about cities, you know, uh, concert hall, uh, cafe, uh, restaurant, museum, uh, whatever uh, we like, or gym, or whatever we like. But uh, this is built on the labor market. You know, if the labor market collapse, uh, the city disappear. So, uh, so it is important, therefore, to, uh, to have a, a system of transport within the city, which allow this labor market to function. And this labor market is not to to have a job and to be close to your job. The labor market means that you move to a city like, like New York, for instance, uh, very large cities, and you move there because you will have a choice throughout your professional life not to have to change jobs when you are not happy with the job you have or, or, or when you are happy, but you see even, even a better job. And yourself, when you start as a young person, uh, you don't know exactly what you are good at 
it's only later in life that you realize it. And this large labor market allows you to see what is your preference. And by the way, the same for firms too. The firms have employees and as their business evolve, they say, well, we will need this type of person now. If they are in New York or in London or, or in Shanghai, they have a better chance to get this person than if they are in a small town. So this, the, the idea of the labor market is not to live close to your job. Uh, it's, it's to be able through the transport system to access any job you like within the metropolitan area. So that was a bit a long introduction, but uh, I think it gives the essence of. Uh... No, no, long, long is good. Um, it, there's a couple of things to parse there. And I do want to talk about how the idea of a labor market, uh, it sort of could be affected by things like COVID and digitization and remote working, what have you. But I think it makes sense to first go into uh, the, the, the core elements of, the, of your book. And most importantly for our listeners who are people who care about creating new special economic zones and new cities, they probably love the, uh, the specific recommendations that you give to urban planners in the book. Um, namely, it, and it goes back to what you were saying that it's, it's not that the government or, or the municipal government is retreating completely and just letting private enterprise or individuals do whatever yeah. they want. It's, it, it's clear responsibilities and checks and balances. Absolutely, clear responsibility, so, exactly, yes. So uh, the question is in, in your book, what are the roles of the political arm, normally mayors, versus urban planners, and also how should and those uh, those uh, urban planners be organized in your view? So, uh, if we are talking about a city which is already existing for for a long time, like New York or, or London, uh, the 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 mayor establish priorities. You know, the, uh, a, a technocrat like me do not establish priorities. It has to come from, so for instance, the mayor will say, well, our major problem is we don't have enough job or, or the environment is terrible, you know, the, the air is bad uh, or our schools are bad and he will establish priorities. Uh, and so the role of the planner is then to say, well, uh, if you want to improve, well, I, I said something for uh, transport, for instance, that the role of the planner is first to understand well how a city works. So for instance, uh, uh, for a large city, it will not be to say, let us have a plan where everybody live within 10 minutes from his job. You know, this is impossible. And it's a contradiction from the idea of a large city. So he, he should advise the mayor or, or she should advise the mayor about what will be the best way to improve uh, you know, the, the speed of transport, practically that way. And maybe also some area of the city are very badly served by transport. Others are well served. That's the case of New York, by the way. Uh, and uh, so it would be to say, well, uh, you know, if you if we develop this type of, uh, of transport in this area, we have, uh, you know, 25% of the population who will have uh, uh, a reduced access, you know, the, the time to, the, the commuting time to access to job will be reduced by 15 minutes. And that will be, so all these things have to be also quantified. You know, this is my problem a bit with words like sustainable or, or livable or things like that. I'm not against sustainability nor livability. But unless, you know, if you just baptize whatever you do as sustainable, nobody can contradict you. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good housekeeping seal, you know, right there. And uh, so you have to, to be quantified. You, you have to quantify it. You have to, if you are talking about the environment, you say, all right, we, we have this type of pollutant uh, in this area of the city. And let's say uh, we want to reduce them that, by 30% in, in doing this, this and that. And if you propose something and it doesn't, you monitor it and it doesn't work. You know, you see that you have done these things to reduce pollution there, but after five years, you have still at the same level of pollution. You have to change your idea immediately. You have to say, okay, let us try something else. You see the problem with being non-quantitative 
uh, in is that we keep doing the same thing who do not work, but we keep repeating it. Uh, in a city, you cannot experiment the way, for instance, if somebody design a, a, a smartphone, they test it in the lab all the time. And the, many people have many ideas and some ideas do not work out. So they immediately modify those ideas. So at the end, they have a work for, you know, they, they have a smartphone will work. But uh, in a city, you cannot uh, test something like that. You, you have to really test things in the real thing. For instance, if you want to make housing affordable, uh, it's not because you design 10 housing units and you, you put a low rent on it that uh, you have solved the affordability problem. So you have to do something at the scale of the city. You cannot test it. You are testing it in real time. That's why it's so important to have indicators. You know, the, the last chapter of my books have a list of indicators and, and these are the indicators which are just uh, linked mostly to, uh, you know, transport and housing. But uh, it, of course you could develop indicators about, uh, about school uh, performance, uh, pollution or whatever, you know, whatever is interesting for the city. But you have to have indicators. You cannot uh, just say, well, uh, I'm working to make a livable city. That's not enough. And, and, and data is, is the core element of your solution. And you get very specific about how to use it. Yes, yes. You, you, the way that I sort of visualize it when looking at the book is you sort of see the role of a planner is kind of when someone's at a, a nuclear power plant, for lack of a better word, and you have all these these dashboards and then right. you see blinking indicators. And if a, 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 a rod is heating up to a certain extent, then you you change. And the light, you, yes, yes, yes. That's an a, excellent comparison. Yes, yes, yes. And you have a very specific methodology where, unlike a lot of urban planners, the main thing you're measuring is impact, but you divide that into different aspects. You right, yeah. The, but the outcome, uh, input, input and output. You start, yeah, you start with input, you know, and unfortunately, most uh, planners or even mayors uh, talk only about input. You know, for instance, they will say, we are going to spend uh, 10 million in transportation next year. And everybody mm -hmm. say, well, that's wonderful. We need more transport. But in itself, it means nothing. I mean, I'm not saying that you should not spend money on transport, but if you stop there, well, uh, you know, it's, so you have input, which is what the city will put in, usually the cities or the taxpayer. Uh, the second is, is uh, output. That means, for instance, you are talking about transport. You say, we are going to, to buy 100 new buses, you know, electric buses, for instance. So that's, that's uh, uh, you know, that will be output. Then you have outcome. What are you going to do with those buses? So those buses are going to run on this street and this street, and you will have a bus every five minutes uh, during rush hour. So this is uh, this is outcome. And then it's impact because you know in itself running buses is not an objective. The object if you put those buses there is because precisely you want to decrease uh, the amount of commuting time of, of a group of people. So. Th the real, the real objective is to say, well, after we have done this, uh, you know, there are say 100,000 people who are living there who can access their job in, again, less than, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or whatever. And this is a justification of your investment. Too often, people are just happy to hear that uh, you know, there is an investment in housing and say, well, that's good because housing is terrible in this city. And but uh, we, we don't uh, we don't have solution for that. And again, here it is quite possible that even very competent people, you know, I have myself a number of skeleton in my closet, frankly, uh, that when you do something because you cannot really experiment in laboratory what you do, it doesn't work the way you think. So you have to modify your project or even uh, abandon it. it and it's, it's very interesting. It's uh, when, when you're looking at it, you're almost getting the impression that you're treating this urban planning division almost as a private enterprise would. You even said that if you measure the output versus the input, you could find out uh, the marginal or the economic rate of return, I think is the term that you use. Um, That's right, yeah, yes, yes. Do you think this model could be applicable to 
privately managed cities, or do you think the models still best serve if you have a publicly run institution at the helm? No, I, I think I think it will be exactly the same for a privately run city. You know, I I have not seen so far a a large city which is privately run. I uh, but I don't see any incompatibility with that. Uh, for instance, uh, recently I was given an example, uh, the, the city of Vancouver, I, I didn't know it, but uh, the, the former mayor of Vancouver told me that uh, the, the entire street network of the center of a certain part of the city, of course, was entirely created privately uh, by the railway company. You know, when, when the Trans-Pacific Railway, the Canadian uh, you know, a railway arrived at Vancouver. Vancouver was a, a little fishing village or something. And they, so the, the railway company acquired all the land and developed all the streets. So they were privately, but with the idea of uh, selling the real estate, of course. You know, it was not for their own use, it was to sell rice. So that was perfectly compatible, you know, there is no incompatibility on that uh, in a way. Uh, they, I, I don't see why a, uh, a private city could not be operated. Um, and the, the fact that there are very few, or, or say the one who exists are relative, they are more like, like neighborhoods, let's say, than, than cities. Uh, but uh, I think it's an accident. Maybe it's because of uh, uh, regulation or, or uh, you know, proper, I don't, I'm not sure why it is so, but I don't see why you could not have a, a uh, you know, the, the problem, of course, uh, I think when you are talking about a new city, you are not talking about a company town, you know, which is, right. you know, you, you have a mine and then the, the, the mine company uh, designs something for their worker. This is not a city for me because it's not a labor market. You know, everybody working in the mine, this is not a market. So, but if you have a real city with a dive, you know, you want to attract people from the outside rather than have already your employee there. Uh, then then uh, I don't see why you could not have a, a private uh, city. I, I don't see. And, and again here, as soon as you have uh, delimited what is private, what is going to be sold or leased, and what is going to be public, I think then the, the planners have to, to concentrate their attention on the private, on the public space. You know, uh, how wide should be the sidewalk? All the streets should be used, you know. Should it be priced? Uh, should people be allowed to park in the street or not? This is very important. Should you plant trees in the street? You know, should you make street uh, wide enough to have trees, for instance? This is very important. What is to me not important is to to have regulation will say uh, here we will have uh, financial building and here we will have uh, commerce but only selling to space. Uh, I, I barely exaggerate, you know, if you look at the, the, the zoning of New York, you have commercial area which are zoned with narrow thing. You know, recently I saw a case where uh, you had a commercial area, you could have a hardware store, but the zoning preventing the hardware store for selling appliances. So you, you could sell a screwdriver, but on, not an air dryer for us. <laughs> uh, and that was in the zoning, you know, in the name of the, the benefit of, uh, of the community. So, the, so this attention to details like that, uh, and I'm sure by the way, the planner who did it probably had the case where there was a little problem with selling appliances, maybe uh, truck parking in front of the store. I don't know. But so they have a tendency to over design what is private and neglect what is public. Yeah, again, if you see New York, you see, for instance, a subway station sometime who completely blocks the sidewalk. And in area where uh, the, the sidewalk should be wider precisely because there is a subway station. Uh, so you see this design should have been solved long ago. They should have said, well, this is a way to do it. You know, they could acquire maybe a little piece or, or make a deal with a, with a private owner or thing like that in order to, to connect that. So that's an extra, it's interesting that you bring that up because of one particularly difficult thing about uh, urban planning for new city projects is something that existing cities don't have is the establishing of the baseline infrastructure 
because of right, yeah. your model, it, it really maps on really nicely onto existing infrastructure. You make little interventions here and you modify, but it, 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 when you have a new city, it's, you can dangerously and easily become the role of a central planner just based on the sheer necessity that there's no basic infrastructure in a greenfield right. site. Yes. So, so how do we use your framework in re, uh, when creating a new city? Versus, I, uh, I, you know, you you could use uh, the the idea of uh, you know, in fact, which was developed in in well in, in New York in a way, but I I prefer to use uh, the example of Barcelona. Uh, when Barcelona expanded, you know, under Serda, you know, the the, the planner, uh, they design. In fact, the design was a street network. You know, they didn't design in a building or anything. A street network which was more than 20 times the existing city. You know, it was not just uh, uh, 10 blocks because in the next years they needed to expand by 10 blocks. They, they expanded, so they, it was nearly like a new city, although it took 100 years, uh, 200 years to be, 150 years to be filled. Uh, but, uh, and again here, you don't need to agonize on the design, I mean, try to do your best to say, we will have main avenue and they will be this wide because we will have this, this and that, that's fine. But do not agonize uh, because in 10 years, you don't know, or 15 years, you don't know what the transport system will be. Uh, you know, if people will go on electric scooters or, or take the subway or something else, or, or Uber or whatever. And so just, just, be clear about the design, you know, so that there is no uncertainty. You know, again, you expect the market to work and the market work if every, the prices are transparent. If there is an uncertainty about uh, an area which is going to be developed, but the street, the main street will move, maybe will be 100 meters farther east or west. You create an uncertainty and no market can work that way or you create even corruption. You know, somebody who knows in advance where this street will be or as a way of influence it uh, will make, and, and that will really in a way destroy partially the essence of the city by uh, having this uh, impression of unfairness and, and certainly inefficiency. So clarity and transparency, you know, transparency is absolutely essential from the beginning. And you even recommend that a city kind of like a, a public company displays their quarterly results for their financials and all the other public data. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. As transparent as possible, even if it's a little embarrassing. And sometimes it's embarrassing for a private company, for, for a, a publicly owned company too. You know, they, they, they have a hard time showing, you know, when they show their, their, their quarterly results, they, they are a little kind of, they need to spin them a bit, but uh, uh, you know, the, the city. And that's why I'm a bit against a master plan, which constitutes as a, you know, a, an enormous effort uh, at the beginning and then 10 years or 15 years to implement the plan. You know, I, I'm not against making projection for instance, if you have a new city, you say, we, we, we think we will have 100,000 people in 10 years. Obviously, you have to plan. You say, well, they will consume that much water. Therefore, we need to get the water there. It will cost that. That's fine. This type of planning is fine. What I argue against is planning, which becomes a regulation. You know, imagine that Apple, when they decide to develop their, their smartphone, say, well, in 10 years, we will sell a 100 million smartphone. And then they realize that, in fact, they, they sell 200 million. But somebody said, no, 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 no. Our plan is 100 million. You know, we should not expand uh, because that's a plan. We need to implement the plan. This will be absurd. So projection, yes. You know, we should project as much as possible, but adjust the projection. And by the way, adjust the infrastructure to your projection of population. Do not do the opposite. You know, many cities, they, they make a projection for population. Then they develop an infrastructure, say for water, for instance, based on consumption of say 200 liter per capita per day. And suddenly there is a demand for an area. And uh, so there is a demand for high rise building and the density increase. And they will tend to say, no, 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 no. Our pipes, 
have been designed for you know a density of 200 people per hectare you cannot build 500 people per hectare it should be the opposite you say well I, we are going to redesign our pipe it's much cheaper to you know infrastructure is cheaper than land in the in the long run so so you should redesign your infrastructure possibly ask the people who buy the IRIs to pay the difference you know that's possible you know to have an impact fee or something but uh, adjust your infrastructure to what the people want to do not uh, not you know where the people go based on the existing infrastructure so and I guess that sort of ties back to one of the original questions uh, about a labor market like you said um, you can't predict too much far in advance. I mean, you should try your best, but there are things yes. that are unpredictable. In this case, in 2020, it was an act of God known as COVID-19. Yeah. Um, is that impacting the role of what a city is? And it, you know, for very, very likely it doesn't, but you're saying that one of the core functions or maybe even the core function of a city is a labor market, but you're finding that many people are working remote a lot of people are deciding that they want to live in less dense areas and they don't have the need for agglomeration effects. Is that a temporary tendency or do you think there's a move for cities, including its infrastructure, to be less related to the labor market aspects, but sort of the, uh, the, the living and enjoyment aspects, yes. you know, being in places so, where there's parks and so libraries, I will, I will give uh, an opinion of what I think, you know, if I was projecting something, that's what I think will, will happen. But uh, I have to say that I don't know. You know, I have an opinion, but I'm not sure. What is very important now is to monitor very, you know, even more closely than normally what is happening. You know, the, the movement of people and of course prices, you know, do the price in the center of New York are coming down, the rents. You know, if for instance now I see the rents in New York, uh, they they give you two or three months free if you rent an apartment in Manhattan. But that's not a real, that means that they, they think that they have a temporary problem, you know, because the lease is still the rent at the old level. And it's just entire, you know, so that's that's fine, you know. They, but it doesn't mean it doesn't show the tendency. I see that uh, builders are still building skyscraper in New York. You know, I've seen. I'm looking at building permits, and uh, just this morning, actually, I had. Uh, uh, I was surprised to see how many new building permits there are in Manhattan. So. Uh, you, you have to, but I may be wrong there. We don't know. And by the way, nobody knows. You know, uh, we are all start now working remote. Uh, some people like it a lot. I mean, I see some advantage, you know, not commuting is a large part, a chunk of your time. But I see also disadvantages, uh, especially for everybody who has to do something creative. Uh, and and creative. Sometimes a plumber has to be creative. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to say that you are you know a, a top thinker or a philosopher or something like that. Uh, you know, you have to adapt to changing circumstances uh, in your business. For instance, you have to see. And if you are working remote, the first year. Uh, will be fine probably uh, you know you are doing what you learn how to do in the past and you are doing it competently and suddenly you will be hit because the business has slightly changed uh, imagine for instance uh, in in my old days you know when i learned how to draft you know a, a building in cities i was using a t-square and triangle so uh, you don't know maybe what the chief square and, and triangle is. You know, you, you drew with you drew with a pen and with rules. You know, and you you didn't have CAD. You know, you didn't draw. You you know, you drew you drew on paper, and it was quite a skill. You know, to draw very fast and you know, and imagine that at the time you suddenly you had to draw. Uh, you know, you you can draw remote, so you will send your drawing by by mail to your boss or to you know to your clients. Uh, and, but suddenly some people start using CAD, but you are in your, in your little village or your suburb there and you, are, you, you know to draw very well, you draw fast and good quality, nice drawing, but you, you are not aware of that. And suddenly nobody asks you for drawings anymore. 
because they are too expensive and, and too cumbersome compared to the CAD drawing. So you would be, and suddenly you would not know what hit you, where if you work in an architectural office downtown and you are drafting, suddenly uh, your firm will acquire some computers and you say, hey, this is, this is nice. And, and you will learn, you know, again, there's this spill, spillover effect. And the spillover effect happen only by sometime randomly. You know, I remember the first time I learned about a spreadsheet, you know, again, that's that's all time. But, you know, we used to do all our pricing on a long hand. Huh? Uh, and, uh, you know, if the interest rate changed, we had to change all our numbers and we, we will do it. And suddenly, uh, you know, I had a colleague who was a financial analyst and he showed me the first uh, spreadsheet, which was called VisiCalc, if I remember well. And and I was absolutely amazed. But uh, architects at the time, you know, planners uh, were not aware of that. It was it was it started really with people who were doing accounting or things like that. And but for us, it was it completely, you know, it removed actually the most boring part of our job. You know, suddenly it become interesting. But it was there only because of the spillover effect. Again, if I had, uh, if I had lived in a small town, you know, in Montana, and uh, probably I would have never heard of a spreadsheet. I would still be doing things with my uh, slide rule and uh, you know, and, and pencil and and, and rubber, you know, erasing thing uh, when thing that. So you see, this aspect I think is very important. And uh, you know, one thing which has not changed is that if you look at Silicon Valley, uh, the people who work in Silicon Valley are the most able to work remote, you know, compared to, uh, you know, a cook or a, a plumber, you know, they cannot work. But Silicon Valley, practically all of them can work remote. And the big firm of uh, Silicon Valley, Apple, Google, uh, Facebook, are all building enormous headquarters, very expensive headquarters, where you try to have as many amenities as possible. You know, a uh, woman can bring their kids there if they want, you know, they, they are little uh, preschool, you know, uh, they have, uh, they, they have, uh, you know, the, the restaurants are excellent too. They, they have gyms, of course, they have all sorts of things. Why do they do that? Not because they are fantastically generous. They want to attract a, a lot, you know, they, they know that, uh, in this field, by meeting randomly people that you will not meet, you know, on uh, on, on a Zoom conference, uh, you you or, or you meet somebody in a meeting, but after that you have a coffee together, and suddenly you realize that they are doing something which slightly overlap with what you are doing, but they have uh, they have a, a a fantastic you know access to a new technology. So that's the way ideas spread. And so I think that in the long run, you will have quite a number of people uh, who are going back to the city because of this. Uh, now, uh, it is possible that you will have, you know, the, the cities now, have all of them throughout the world, right? it's not a cultural thing, whether it's North America, Europe, or, or Asia, or Latin America, or Africa, all of them, the, the traditional monocentric city is dispersing. So you still have a center, you know, with a lot of amenities, you know, museum and concert, all things like that. But firms, the jobs are decentralizing in the suburbs. This is a general, you know, in uh, in Paris, for instance, metropolitan area, which is about 10 million people, you know, Paris itself, historical Paris is two and a half million, but 10 million, 70% of the trips in Paris are from suburbs to suburbs, are not toward Paris, uh, you know, the downtown Paris that all the tourists know. Uh, only 30% are from suburbs to Paris downtown or within Paris downtown. And the same for Manhattan, by the way. Manhattan also has, strangely enough, the same proportion of trips. 30% of the trip of the 20 million of the metropolitan area of New York are uh, toward Manhattan or within Manhattan where and 70% are from suburbs to suburbs. So, so it is possible that um, you will have an acceleration of the development of the suburbs, including 
possibly amenities that you don't have, especially in a uh, in an American suburbs, you have not many amenities compared to a downtown, you know, like downtown uh, Manhattan. And it's possible that you have, you will have more uh, more restaurants. I, I see that right away. You know, I, I live in a suburb uh, right now in, uh, you know, of New York, where, where about 35 minutes from Manhattan. And uh, I see that the streets now have much more animation. On, on Saturday night in this little town of 8,000, there is a main street and uh, the restaurants are full, you know, but they are uh, on the sidewalk. It's still warm enough to, uh, to be on the sidewalk. There are more people for some reason, maybe because they spend all their week online, they have more the needs to meet and as they cannot, you know, there is not much reason to go to Man to New York because uh, many of the things are closed in New York anyway, plus it's long. So it gives, so it's possible that you have this change, but I don't know really what I, uh, in a certain way, you know, the COVID, the working online uh, make the labor market fantastically efficient in a way, uh, the world is your labor market. You know, you, you, theoretically, I mean, not taking into account the difference of time, but uh, the time, you know, so yes, in a way, it's a very good thing. But uh, I think that part of the labor market is this face-to-face -face contact uh, to, to be aware of, uh, of changes. So we usually like to end fairly speculative on this podcast. And I think this, this question might wrap everything up pretty nicely. So considering all the trends that you just mentioned here, um, if, if one is a new urbanist on our show, either that they want to work within an existing city or create a new city, um, in fact, maybe you want to split it up. What advice you'd give a new urbanist who's working on an existing city versus a new urbanist that's trying to create a new city project? What opportunities should they, should they pursue and what type of trends should they, they look at when pursuing their careers? Uh, they should, for instance, uh, for existing city, uh, they should try to monitor. Uh, we, we have lost uh, your 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 your, uh, your sound. Uh, they should uh, they should monitor uh, very carefully, uh, especially the new way of getting data. You know, uh, for instance, on trans transport is extremely exp important, and the time people spend on transport is very important. Uh, you know, if you, you have too long commuting time, again, you lose quality of life and productivity. So transport is very important. It happened now that there are a lot of way of extracting very useful real time data about transport. Uh, so if you are a planner in an existing city, try to acquire the skill to know how you can extract data from Uber or from, from telephone or something like that, you know, proxies, which will give a good idea, not only about transport, but housing too, you know, uh, to, to have a very granular view of the rents which are paid in the city. I will even say block by block, you know, you will learn, you will learn what, uh, what is what and who is eliminated from this city? You know, what type of people are eliminated because it's too expensive or it's too far. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will try to, now it doesn't mean that you should not have the traditional skill of the planner, but learning about the history of planning, about the history of cities and, and you know, so, you know that's, uh, and of course cartography, cartography is very important. I think that I'm always, sometimes I find the planners who are not very comfortable with the scale of maps and I, I feel a upset by that. So uh, this is for, for the, so th that I think the complementary skills and it's all the more important because uh, the data which are available now are changing constantly and you have more and more. Uh, so this is for the planner who is uh, uh, working for an existing city. For a new city, I think that the major thing is to say, oh, I will attract people and firms in my city. What comparative advantage do I give? You know, people are not going to move to your city 
because the sewer works well, you know, because uh, all the cities, many cities of the world have an excellent sewer system. So they, they are not, so of course you should have a good sewer, obviously, <laughs> but uh, this is, you know, to when I see, for instance, uh, uh, some cities where being built in Saudi Arabia, uh, I have the feeling that they feel that if everything is very modern, people will come. I don't believe so. I think that, uh, uh, you know, you have to have something special to attract them, either location or already a group of people, you know, a bit in the, you know, in the old days when they were building shopping malls in the suburbs, uh, the designer of shopping malls were very, after some years, become very, uh, very, had a lot of experience about that. And they realized that if they want to attract people in a shopping mall, they have to have some anchors, things like, like a, a big department store like Macy's or, or Bloomingdale. And then after that, the profit will be made really from the other uh, will come. But you cannot attract a, a, you know, so that's the thing. So in a new city, it should be something like that, that why should people come here? Uh, in the old days, it was location. You know, that, uh, uh, you know, location created the opportunity, you know, that you, you had a port or, or sometime you had, uh, uh, you know, a, a religious festival, for instance, or something like that, you know, and, and it was enough to attract people. And then after that, you differentiate, you know, the, the, the end. But uh, so for a new city, you have to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who has a job in, uh, say, uh, Rome or, or, or Amsterdam and say, gee, there is a new city there. Why don't I go and work there? Why, why should they do that? And so you have to find a reason for that. It could be the climate, it could be uh, the environment, it could be fantastic schools. Um, I don't know. You know, again, it depends on the type of people you want to attract. Um, you know, in, in a certain way, uh, Singapore is doing that because Singapore now, uh, although it's, it's not a new city, but uh, they, are, they are expanding their population, but the, you know, the, the original population, the Singaporean or Singaporean citizens are not growing very fast, but they need to attract people because they are a high tech city and the city is too small to provide all the specialization that they need for an high tech city. So they have, they have two types of migrants that they, they, they collect, either high tech, you know, people in biologists or people like that, uh, and it's worldwide, huh? or, and then there are the people that, uh, the job that Singaporean don't want, you know, washing dishes in restaurants and things like that. So they have this thing and they are calibrating uh, these things in order to attract those people because they have to attract them. You see, and I think a new city will be like that. You will have to, you have to attract people. So you have to put, so I'm sure the people in Singapore try to att attract a biologist or, or a, uh, you know, or a financial wizard. They, uh, they put themselves in their shoes and they say, well, I have a good job in London, you know, why should I go to Singapore? And, uh, and by the way, in, in Singapore, the contract are only five years. So you have to attract them for five years. Huh? They, you don't become a citizen because you live there. Because they precisely know that maybe in five years, they will need different skills. So they will adjust, uh, you know, they, they, uh, that's a special. And so the, the Gulf country are doing a bit less sophisticated, but the same thing, you know, they are attracting people by the clay, uh, poor people, by relatively higher salary than what you will get in Bangladesh, for instance, or, or Nepal. So they attract them to work there, uh, give them working condition or less than idle, but they, you have always to think, how do you attract people? To essentially treat your city as a, as a company and your citizens as- As clients. As clients, yeah. Uh, potential clients, yes, 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 yes. So you see, it's quite different because if you are living already in New York or Amsterdam or London, uh, your city is attractive enough already. You don't have to worry, you know, people will come uh, and uh, you don't have to worry. And even you could, you could manage probably with a relatively stagnant population. 
it's kind of like IBM versus Apple. IBM yes. didn't really have a need to compete. That, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, so Startup Society entrepreneurs are listening to this. You heard it from, from the man himself. Find that it factor, whether that's the labor of the market or something a little bit more ethereal, uh, ethereal to uh, compete and start your new city. Uh, Elaine, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, everyone, thank you for joining in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye.